to listen to some of the works of Roisin Kelly and any other experiences that she tells us about along the way. She's the author of two poetry books, Mercy and Rapture, which is a chapbook that she published a couple years after. Um, she's the winner of the Fish Poetry Prize, and she's also the recipient of funding from the Irish Arts Council and the Cork City Arts Council for continuing her writing. Uh, she's just completed a residency at Tippett Rise for the last 10 days um, that was uh, sponsored by Poetry Ireland's International Residency Program, uh, which is an amazing, an amazing thing that we've been privileged with her presence here today. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Roisin Kelly. for coming out and thank you um, for having me, um, Maeve and Ben and Catherine and Lindsay from Tippet Rice. I just spent um, a really beautiful week there, kind of immersed in the landscape. Um, yeah, this is my first time in Montana. It's uh, so beautiful, like I can't really believe that I'm in the American West. Um, it feels almost as if I've been here before in a strange way. Um, Although Irish people have a really like annoying tendency to like when we see something in a different country, we'll be like, oh, that looks like wherever in Ireland. <laughs> so I was doing that a lot. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from my book. I'm going to read some newer poems. And I never want to read for too long because I feel like poetry is best done like in shorter bursts, you know, maybe after 20 or 25 minutes. I know my attention span starts to go a bit, so I'll read for a while and then if you guys have any questions, we can have a chat. And I am going to chat a little bit about each of the poems because um, I think there's probably a bit of context needed for them because I'm not reading to an Irish audience. So. I'm, I'm first going to read Mercy, which is the poem that my book takes its title from. And I wrote this um, on a Greek island in 2017 or 2016. And this was a very fraught period for women in Ireland um, because the Catholic Church had a uh, exerted a lot of control over our country. Still does, but not so much these days. And we had a very controversial, emotional referendum for abortion rights. Um, but the conversation leading up to the referendum went on for years and years. And it was quite hard on me and my friends. Um, because the way we won the referendum was to tell our stories. Um, and to make our families listen and our friends listen. And once I think this goes for all political change, people can have ideas, but once they hear the stories of the people they know who are closest to them, their minds change. And that was the case in Ireland. Um, however, it was really hard on us, the discourse. Um, and when I was on this Greek island, I. <laughs> I took a notion, as we say in Ireland, and I went skinny dipping one night um, in, in the dark because I wanted to see these like luminous, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it or heard of it, it's called like bioluminescence, and it lights up the water in all these twinkly um, glow-in-the-dark sparkles, and I really wanted to see that. So I went and I did that. It was a very cool, moving experience. But it also, um, my, what I realized was that I felt such a disconnect from my own body during this experience. And there was just a complete alienation between me and my physical form because of these conversations that were happening and because of the laws we had in Ireland at the time. So this poem is a kind of prayer um, to be reunited with my physical self. Mercy. On the beach I undress in the dark, naked and blind before the gods, below too many stars. Here is my body, 
which I was told to never touch. An orthodox shrine glows red by the closed coffee truck. But as the Aegean comes to my hips, rises within me, my movements stir luminous plankton or algae, bright opal specks in the water that drift from my wrists around my cold breasts. They glow and swirl and die like shooting stars, turned on by my nakedness. They are kind. I didn't think such tiny compassion could make me want to cry. How gorgeous they are, mysterious creatures, dazzling the same seas that Homer once looked on, that surrounded the ancient Greeks on all sides. When I begin to walk back, I will hide from the twin sons of any car I hear coming. All women learn to be shadows, crouching down low in the pines. Artemis, I can turn only to you in a world with such dim light to live by. Give me the flight of deer through the woods, fleeing the hunter's sharp spears. Help me decipher these sparkling trails like the Milky Way's dust in Morse code. Guide the small boat of my body back to myself. Tell me which path brings me home. Um, so I'm going to read another, I know maybe you guys were expecting more Ireland, I will read some more Ireland based books. But um, this one is also set on the same island. It's called Penelope. Um, I was in Ben's class earlier on Ulysses and I was very embarrassed to admit that I have not read <laughs> uh, for an Irish person that I will read it when I go home. <laughs> <laughs> However, the Odyssey did make a big impression on me, um, especially the figure of Penelope, who waits around for Odysseus, Odysseus for seven years, weaving. And I used to live on an island myself in Ireland, and I was a hand weaver there and I lived with my boyfriend, and I was quite young at the time, I was 21, and I was sort of, um, realized that I was kind of like Penelope, like weaving, I was his, his mother's apprentice, and waiting for him to come home in the evenings. Um, but this one was, is written a few years later, um, on the same Greek island. And this is a more kind of, joyful, life-affirming poem. And it's a little bit about language as well. Um, I make a reference to Bod Bjog Stamati, which means Stamati's little boat um, in Irish. Um, Ir Irish is not um, very commonly spoken in Ireland anymore um, because of colonization and um, efforts made to stamp out our culture and our language. Um, I wish I could speak Irish, but I don't. So this is Penelope. In a tongue that still belongs to me, despite everything, I try to name it his little boat, Bod Bjog Stamati. But for the dried coral and starfish, for his sharp knife, I have no words, nor for how sunlight in the evening panels the water, or for how the island from here is all stone and scrub. I can't even name the ocean's colour in English, that shimmer between turquoise and teal. As Damati begins to cast his nets, one brown foot braced on the tiller, I pour some wine to the waves and think how free I am. I could stay at sea for seven years, and never dream of coming home in any language. Stamati, who speaks only Greek, gives me more wine. Tonight he'll dance while the rest of us kneel on the terrace, clapping in time. His son will throw a plate at his feet, Iani, a delicate glass. The waiters will give me ouzo and shots of tequila, 
with rinds of orange to suck and sugar to lick from my hand. I will tuck my shirt into my bra and run around barefoot where glass has been broken. Tomorrow will bring the worst hangover of my life. For now, sunset spills its gold rings as the prow splits the sea's warp of silk. My feet are bare on the boards. My hair gives itself to salt and the wind. As I am carried home, subdued and happy, like a new wife. Um, so the next poem I'm going to read, really, um, there's been a kind of affinity between the Irish people and the various native communities of America for a long time. I think it's because we have had a similar experience um, under colonization. So um, in Ireland, I, I guess I don't know, I, you know, maybe you guys know all about the potato famine of Ireland, but in the 1840s, um, there was a potato famine where the potatoes rotted in the fields um, and people starved to death and they emigrated to America. Um, and that's why there are so many people with Irish names in America today. Um, I say famine, but that's kind of frowned upon nowadays to call it a famine because it wasn't a famine. The potatoes were spoiled, but there was, pl there was plenty of food in Ireland, but it was controlled by the English and it was all being shipped back to England. Um, But the Shakta, when they heard about what had happened, um, sent money to us, um, even though I think the Trail of Tears had only uh, taken place um, not long before that. The poem isn't quite about the famine or the Shakta. It's, um, it's about Standing Rock and the Standing Rock Sioux. And I wrote this maybe when I was a little bit more idealistic and passionate, but I really imagined a sort of um, apparition with the protesters at Standing Rock um, in solidarity. Um, you know, as I say, I wrote this when I was a bit younger. It's a little bit more idealistic and fancy free. Um, it's called Miracle at Standing Rock, which is a pun on um, an event in Ireland called Miracle at Knock, um, which took place in the 1870s when um, villagers had, um, they saw an apparition of, um, I have to check, Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John the Evangelist, and Jesus Christ, who was represented by a lamb. Um, and this was not, this was 30 years after the famine. Um, that's where the kind of apparition and the theme of ghostly figures appearing came in. Um, Knock is now a Catholic pilgrimage site in Ireland and you can buy all sorts of tacky Catholic. <laughs> There's a lot of souvenir shops. Miracle at Standing Rock. In Ireland, we know the holiness of water cooling between green blades in the fields, resting in marble fonts at church doors. The grey Atlantics rise and fall by Murrisk's famine ship sculpture, the rain that people prayed in for hours when Our Lady appeared to them at knock. They said the rosary over and over, bringing wet beads through their fingers. It was 35 years since a poor farmer's spade birthed our country's first rotting potatoes from the life-giving ground. Water cannot cure hunger, or the Chakta would have drunk their sorrow as they set out on the trail of tears. But water joins their land to ours 
Water they carried the corn that they sent us, though they had so little for themselves. In some places, water itself is a miracle. You can't, you can't drink the black slick of oil, yet it goes on being raised anyway, like a potato slime that feeds no one. Why did those potatoes turn? We can't say for sure. Why did Knox people pray hour after hour by a gable wall and later testify to the Lamb of God, the altar, the Virgin's glittering crown? That too is uncertain. Fifteen witnesses and the one thing their testimonies agreed on was rain, rain and the gathering dark. Why did the English refuse to send food to Mayo and Galway? Why were the white men afraid of the ghost dance? These are things we share in our stories. Rain and the gathering dark, our stolen land and our hunger for miracles. Here is a story about in which darkness it can best be proved. The bridge between past and present that does exist as both our tribes have always known. Come, let us eat the lamb. Let its blood replenish the bisonless land. In its vast silty bed, the Missouri finally rests, as at peace as when it first fell as rain. Sometimes I forget that uh, I end that poem with a vision of um, the lamb of God being eaten. <laughs> <laughs> the lamb that appeared on the gable wall. Um, yeah, I mean, I am proud of the book I have written, but sometimes it's like a different person wrote it. You know, I think I published it in 2020. Um, so I'll read some new ones that aren't exactly new because I've been working on them for a long time. But they're a little bit more aligned with I was kind of trying to explain to Ben's class earlier that when I was writing in my 20s, I was very like passionate and raw and idealistic and kind of given to flights of fantasy. Um, and now that my emotions have calmed down a little bit, and I've had the time to really like work on formalizing my craft. Um, there's a little bit less of that. But emotionally, it's Psychologically, it's probably a good thing. Um, I'm going to read a poem called North. Um, so I'm originally from the north of Ireland, which um, is still British territory. And I don't know how much you guys know about what it was like there in the 70s and 80s, but it was a really violent place. Um, there was a lot of death and destruction and people today are still quite traumatized from it. And my parents were members of the nationalist Catholic community. And um, so they really had to live um, under a system that denied them their civil rights. And um, I think that really wears down on you psychologically when you're a member of a group that is repressed in favour of another class. Um, we left the north of Ireland when I was four because the violence was still continuing in the 90s and they were like, this is not a good place to raise kids. Um, so we moved to a very rural county called Leitrim in the Republic of Ireland. Um, it's only in the last few years that I've started to try to come to terms with um, not having had the opportunity to live in the city where I, where generations of my family lived there. Um, we were from Belfast, we were from the north of Ireland, and when we moved to the south, that really broke that chain. And it has caused me some pain to realize that I never had the chance to be part of the community there and to be around my relatives. So this poem is set on a mountain in Leitrim, um, 
where there's a mass rock. My father took me there. A mass rock is where um, Catholics would have secret mass um, during the time when uh, the practice of Catholicism was banned. And it's on a mountain because um, you could see soldiers coming from a long way away and you could run away then. And basically from this mountain, I'm really looking at um, the land to the east where there's like industry and the west where there's mines and eventually I turn my gaze um, to the north and I address it directly. Um, it has an epigraph by Seamus Heaney um, from his same poem called North. Keep your eye clear as the bleb of the icicle. Trust the feel of what nubbed treasure your hands have known. North. My parents lived under Black Mountain, in the valley of the shadow of death. They met aged 16 at the Europa Hotel, Europe's most frequently blown up hotel. The half moon curve into Hazelwood Avenue, the stone slab that says Hazelwood Avenue. Andy Town pole glass, the Falls Road, West Belfast, fixing buses, raising their kids, went to masses, played guitars, shared history, tight-knit community, worshipping mysteries on plastic rosary beads. I was an Andy Town fern, dug up and transported, south of the border, hidden from soldiers. The soldiers are British, I'm Irish, they're British, I'm Irish, I'm Irish, I'm Irish. Here's how I spent the next decade in Leitrim. I dig a bottle from the dirt round my home. It's blue glass engraved milk of magnesia. I scratch the English word for frost into a glittering silage bale's frost. By day, Schlieve on Eren fades in. At night, it fades out again, like a paper mountain. My mother likes to look at the mountain. She says it reminds her of home. My father brings me to the mountain summit, to a cleft between outcrop and cliff. Catholics once said mass in secret here, concealed in the cold sacred split. A stone altar is scattered with pennies. A tea light is drowned in a jar. Schlieve on Eren means Iron Mountain, named for its deposits of ore. They smelted the iron with charcoal till there were no trees left to make charcoal. Now dark blocks of Sitka plantations absorb all sunlight and sound. No one is watching for soldiers approaching over heather and marshland and turf. The borderlands factories lie to the east, where thin ladders crawl up to heaven, between silos for storing cement. To the south is Masonite smokestack, to the west, Coley Arigna's black dust. But it is to you, North, that I turn now, gazing into the distance between us, where a fabled forest my teachers spoke of once stretched from shore to shore, so that, they said, a red squirrel could travel the country without ever touching the ground. Just a note on that like last few lines. Um, Ireland was once covered in an ancient forest, which was very important to the kind of Irish um, myth and psyche. Um, it, Ireland is really bad for we pretty much are all fields. Um, we don't have any woods left. Um, but also I speak of the red squirrel, which nearly went extinct in Ireland because um, 12 gray squirrels were brought from Britain as a wedding present and they escaped and they pretty much wiped out the, red, the native red squirrel. Um, what are we doing for time? <laughs> I'll read a few more. I'll read one more sad one and then maybe I'll pick it up a little bit. Oh no, wait, they're all sad. <laughs> um, but yeah. 
So, does anyone remember what year Notre Dame burned down? What year was that? Was it 2019? Yes. Um, so, when Notre Dame burned down, I was actually distraught. Um, and then when I heard that one of the rose windows had survived, I was, I don't know, I cried and cried. I don't know why people get so attached to buildings like that. Um, so when Notre Dame burned down, a few things happened in the news cycle at the same time. And the first photograph of a black hole was published, which was very exciting. Um, of course, when we see the black hole, we're not seeing the black hole as it is now. It's taken 50 million years for its light to reach us, so we're seeing it as it was 50 million years ago. And another thing happened in the north of Ireland where um, dissident Republicans were rioting with the police and um, a 29 year old journalist called Lyra McKee was fatally shot and we were actually born in the same year and she had written about um, the effects of the violence in Northern Ireland on the gen her generation, which is also my generation, and the rates of suicide among teenagers um, for being so traumatized. So then when she was killed in rioting only like four years ago, um, it really like made people ask, why is this still happening? How can we fix our society? Um, a lot of people were really shocked and upset by this. Um, and those three things I just sort of brought together in a poem. It's called First Photograph of a Black Hole and it's for Lyra McKee. On Good Friday a rose window rises where the sun should be and a budlia bursts through a crack in the wall in a shaft of pink glitter and rubies, I'm barefoot and hanging up my clothes. So much depends on a single wire and a concrete yard of one's own. On the news is the first photograph, not of an actual black hole, but the light that surrounds and defines it, light it will one day consume. I stand before the bullet hole in a pillar of the GPO and put my eye to it. It tunnels down through 50 million years towards that ring of fire, decaying rose, burning wheel rotating through the dark. At the moment in time the photograph captures, rainforests covered Earth's poles. What lies beyond the painted gable wall, the event horizons glow. Every frequency hisses with static, the sound of an underground falls. What language can there be between the living and the dead? On the news, the women paint their palms with red. On the news, a stained glass window floats above a smoking pile of rooftop beams that once were ancient trees. Of heights, no oaks in France can now replace. Yet still as it has always done, the surviving disc translates the light that filters from our sun into the word color, into the word faith, within a lattice of circles. My father, the photographer, captured Notre Dame at night on his honeymoon in 1989. Orange lit limestone suspended in amber, ivy creepers trailing to the Seine. It was the year the Berlin Wall came down, even though back home in Belfast, they were addicted to walls at that time. They couldn't put up enough of them. Window glow, barefoot go, over concrete made rainbow. So much depends on a country of one's own. So much depends on a budlia with its roots between the stones. Maybe I can read some happier ones. I'll read two more. Maybe we can have that Q&A, yeah. They say happy, but like, I don't think they're happy. Um, a few years ago, I helped out with the olive harvest on a farm in Portugal in the mountains. Um, they harvest olives in the winter. 
Um, I think if I'd known I was staying in a cabin, an unheated cabin in the mountains of Portugal, I would not have gone. It was really, really cold. There was ice outside and I think the temperature inside the cabin um, was pretty much the same temperature. But this farm and these mountains made a big impression on me. There's something really timeless about it. And I'm actually writing a novel that's set in the same valley. And I thought this would be a nice one to write because or to, to read because I just had a week at Tippet Rise and there's the same kind of timeless quality to the landscape there. And the cabin I was staying in was way nicer than, <laughs> than in Portugal. Um, this is called Dominio Vale de Mondego. Vale de Mondego is the name of the valley and Dominio Vale de Mondego is the name of the farm. <laughs> you beat the branches with a stick so that olives fall as quickly as the days are passing. Every night at the press, the smell of crushed olives like warm darkness you could eat. Here they eat their bread with olive oil and salt. At dawn the olive nets are glittering with frost. The harvest must be in before the solstice. Your flock of sheep must be in before the night. The terraces in this valley are ancient. Pine needles make quiet the old Roman road. When I close my eyes, all I see is olives falling, and you bending to pick up a lamb, just as the pink terraces of dusk begin to fade. A shepherd, a farmer, efficient and practical man, more than anyone you know how an hour has no meaning. There is only a sheep's bell ringing out the distance between you, and the time left in which you can follow it. In this village of shawled widows, who might they call which? At the river I write your name on an apple that I cast into water as black as your name. Turbines pause in turning on the mountain, each red lamp burning on a trinity of blades. Above the Spanish border, a hawk is drifting, forever. Olives rise from nets and hover mid-air. Now, is it day? Is it night? It is neither. The air is a pure colour. And I guess, like, This is the poem that like, kind of like really helped my career because it was published on the Poetry Foundation. Um, the, the Poetry Magazine, like, few, like it was a good few years ago now, and published a special Irish issue and the ma <coughs> was kind of working with my boss at the time who ran a literature center. And he was like, do you want to submit something? I was like the secretary or something. And I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> And so I'm not saying I got into the Poetry Foundation on like my own merits or whatever, it was very much luck and stuff, but um, I didn't realize what a big deal it was to get published on the Poetry Foundation. And I said that to him afterwards and he was like, yeah, I know you didn't. <laughs> he was kind of annoyed about it, that I wasn't like more thrilled. But at the time I was more like, oh my God, they paid $10 a line. <laughs> How many lines is this? <laughs> I think it's like 50 lines, so I was thrilled. But over the years, this has been the poem that's kind of, um, people reach out to me a lot about it, and um, they seem to like it. So I guess I'll read it. Oranges. I'll choose for myself next time, who I'll reach out and take as mine. In the way I might stand at a fruit stall, having decided to ignore the apples, the mangoes and kiwis, but hold my hands above a pile of oranges, as if to warm my skin before a fire. Not only have I chosen oranges, I'll also choose which orange. I'll test a few for firmness, scrape, my, scrape some rind off with my fingernail, so that a citrus scent will linger there all day. I won't be happy with the first one I pick, but we'll try different ones until I know you. 
how will I know you? You'll feel warm between my palms, and I'll cup you like a handful of holy water. A vision will come to me of your exotic land, the sun you swelled under, the tree you grew from. A drift of white blossoms from the orange tree will settle in my hair, and I'll know. This is how I will choose you, by feeling you, smelling you, by slipping you into my coat. Maybe then I'll climb the hill, look down on the town we live in, with sunlight on my face and a miniature sun burning a hole in my pocket. Thirsty, I'll suck the juice from it, from you. When I walk away, I'll leave behind a trail of lamp bright rind. Um, does anyone have any when I had a bad breakup <laughs> and I moved to a new city and the city was rainy and cold and dark and it was the middle of winter and I had no friends and I had all these like emotions that I just, I had just done a master's in writing so I had been writing poetry as part of that but I was kind of like, it was more of a like, um, kind of seeing if I could write a poem, kind of like more like um, a challenge, like a technical challenge for me. But then once my life fell apart, I just found that poetry was a really good way like to channel all that kind of pain. And it kind of made the pain worth it in a way, um, which is really, I guess that's where art really comes from. It's like those feelings kind of made manifest and then they kind of, it kind of gives value to your feelings. Um, but I started then submitting um, to journals, like to Irish journals at first, and getting rejected, then sometimes accepted, and then I went a little further afield with um, the UK. Uh, much more rejection, but then the acceptances started coming in, and... Um, and then my book was published, and it's, it's with a publisher in the UK that was that it was the only one that I wanted to be published with. But now that you've asked that question, I'm suddenly remembering all these things where I'm like, oh, because of where I worked at that literature center, that's how Neil Astley at Blood Axe Books kind of got wind of me and my boss really like, um, was a big supporter of mine and stuff. So actually maybe it was kind of negative. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't ju it wasn't just me, you know, I mean, I've been really, really lucky and in Ireland the literary circles are so small um, but so vibrant that you really, um, you luck does come your way, so I, I imagine maybe it's very great here. <laughs> Not to put anyone off. <laughs> Do you, do you feel like, it seems like you, there was a bulk of some of the poems that are written from a certain emotional place. Do you feel like you have like certain emotions that drive you to write more poems? Or do you write poems from like, a whole spectrum of emotions? Or just from some? Or are, they, are there some you like to write more? Or do you need to write more? Um, yeah, I think it's the strongest emotions that Um, so when I used to have these like mad crushes and I'd fall in love with various unsuitable boys, <laughs> poetry would come from that. And then as I got older, I became very political. And as I mentioned, the atmosphere in Ireland was really charged. So well, then I started writing um, poems that were much, much more political, but also that kind of celebrated like the women that I knew and the, my female friendships. Um, because it was like really hard for us and 
but I just was so in awe of their strength and resilience. So that's where that kind of came from. And my emotions aren't so strong anymore because I'm older and I've been to therapy. <laughs> and I'm a much more stable person, which is good, but I feel like maybe that's not ideal for poetry. I am still writing poetry, but I'm also writing a novel, which maybe suits the stability of my mood nowadays. But um, I would say if you're experiencing young, if you're young and you're experiencing strong emotions, maybe uh, try to channel it while you can, because uh, it will probably level out as yeah, I think we were talking, Catherine, about like missing that rawness of our early writing and that the more you practice your craft and um, kind of master the formalities of language and rhythm and style, the rawness, the little bit of rawness and maybe I would call it grace, kind of disappears a bit. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sorry. One, one, one more, I guess, is just like, in your poems, you, you tie together experiences or metaphors from all these different places, and I guess, how do you, or do you have any advice for, or how do you go about choosing what to tie together? I think it's about a state of mind, and having that uh, pattern-seeking brain that we all have. Um, <laughs> It's an evolutionary thing, really, I think. But if you're kind of in tune with it, um, you can kind of use it. I don't, yeah, I don't, I think it's a state of mind and maybe spending time by yourself and being lonely and bored. <laughs> and then you start to engage. Because my poems are quite a, a lot about the landscape. So if I rise, I was. I wasn't lonely and bored per se, but I was alone. <laughs> and I was kind of really getting to grips with the landscape and then all these sort of associations started suggesting themselves to me. And when, when that starts happening, I just journal it, like free writing. No one's ever going to see it. It's cringe to look back on, but I'll have a few pages in my journal that's filled with just free writing and association. And this is, reminds me of this, and this reminds me of this. And then later I'll come back to it and it'll just be like rubbish or whatever, um, nonsense. But then you start to like just pick out certain images and lines that aren't so rubbish and you're like, that's when you start to craft a poem. Um, first you need to write like a load of nonsense first though. And um, when you're writing like that, the associations do start coming to you and um, you might not even be aware that you've written them down until you come back to have a look and then you're like, oh god, um, that thing is like that other thing. <laughs> um, but, and then you ditch the rest. You really have to become ruthless, um, very, like, very disciplined and ruthless when it comes to your excess words and recognizing when it's excess and does it make sense. And, um, Yeah, and you have to kind of make it a bit cleaner then. Yeah. Um, and I and people have asked me as well, like, how do you know when you ha should cut something in the stages of drafting a poem? And I always say that, like, you feel it, like, it's like a gut instinct, but you might ignore it for years before eventually you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's right, thank you. How often do you scrap poems? And like, if you were to start a new one, would it be on a completely different idea or a similar one? Um, I haven't had to scrap a poem in a while because most of the poems that I wrote, like I had like a lot of poems. And then I had to like choose some from my book and the rest got scrapped. Um, yeah, these days I'm kind of more careful almost. Um, I don't scrap them. I think that they're done and then I realize that they're not. So I like put them into a folder on my computer where I'm like, 
this could be something someday, but it's not there yet. Um, my main thing is that I find that the when you start, when you have an idea for a poem, when you start writing it, um, the first quarter of what you've written usually has to be scrapped. And I find like a lot of writers are like that too. Yeah, and it's really hard because you're like, but the poem wouldn't exist without this first initial idea, this first quarter. But I, I think it's one of those mysteries. It's like, why is the start of the poem usually like halfway down the poem? And then you have to get rid of everything that birthed it, which is kind of sad. Um, but yeah, I, I, writers I've spoken to have found that, that the poem doesn't start where they thought it started and then it is really hard to let go of the initial sort of stages of it. That's a mystery, yeah, that is a mystery. <laughs> um, I'm curious what kind of challenges you might be facing um, while writing a novel in comparison to your poetry. Yeah, it's not, it, it's not really, it's not that possible. Um, you have to be in such a different mindset for writing poetry. And then the novel, I love writing the novel because it's like going to work. You just sit down and you start writing or you start working on what you wrote the day before and you're structuring it and plotting it and it has all these stages and it's all, you're, well, you're working on laying it out for yourself and then you have like the layout to work with. But then poetry, like, because I'm fulfilled in my novel writing and I have that structure, then I don't feel um, as compelled to write poetry. And maybe when the novel is finished, I'll be writing more. I'm writing a little bit. So mostly what I'm doing is free writing and I free write in my journal, I free write on a document in Google Docs and I free write on my notes app and I'm always kind of sending then my notes app, my whatever notes I write into my email so I don't lose it. Um, so while I'm writing the novel I'm also generating hundreds of thousands of words in other forms that uh, I'm hoping there'll be, I, there will, there will definitely be, be poems in there someday, but for now it's mostly just free writing. Um, yeah. So has there been anything in Montana, like that you, while you've been in Montana, it's like surprised you or like really piqued your interest just like being in, in this place? Um. This, the surprise element, I think, comes from it just being so different from Ireland. I mean, obviously, it's different from Ireland, but I think it's easy to think that just because we all um, speak the same language, that you can come over here and it'll be just, it'll be easy, it'll be just like home, um, and you will feel you won't, you'll feel the same way that you did at home, but obviously the US is a different country and Montana as a landscape is just so overwhelming. It's, I think it's the vastness of it. And um, yeah, Tippet Rise, like they have like huge sculptures dotted through the land, but they, even they just seem so small in comparison to the landscape. And I felt small in comparison to them and to the landscape. So I think um, the thing that's really struck me most about Montana is that everything is on like this macro scale. Um, big, big mountains, big plains. Um, the whole, there's such a vibrancy to like the, the creeks and the trees in autumn and it really made me start thinking about the differences between here and Ireland where I think in Ireland um, 
things are a little bit more, you're almost, I don't know, it's kind of like we have a lot of holy wells and that kind of thing, so it's, and coves by the sea, so everything is kind of like on a much smaller scale, but here everything is just so big and you start to realize like why it posed such challenges to all the people who've ever lived here. Yeah, I, I get it now. <laughs> I, I get why it, um, the uh, inhospitability of it to like the earlier people. Yeah, uh, and it got it just really got me thinking like what a challenge it must have been to to live in such a place. Yeah, and I know that your uh, winter is coming very soon. <laughs> I've been told. Yeah, that's that's hard as well. Yeah.